Make our way to our seats. Everyone, please make your way to your seats so we can give Holger full attention. Mm -hmm. All right, Holger Neubauer. All right, thank you. You're welcome. It's been great to be with you. It's great again to be with you. I appreciate so much the attitude of study and openness to the Word of God. And I appreciate uh, what William had to say. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17, the Bible says, He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. Now, I was first. And William came and searched me. But it doesn't say only the first would be searched. Okay? <laughs> so I'm going to search him back out just a little bit in good spirit because we are friends. And the Bible says a friend searches him out. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, In the thing that hath been... It is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Now, is racism a problem today? Was it a problem in the last generation? Was it a problem two generations ago? There is no new thing under the sun. I believe that racism was a problem then as well. Now let me clarify my position. I'm not saying that God was concerned with the racial distinctions. No doubt those were religious distinctions that were vanishing by being united together into one body and in Christ. What I'm arguing is that the distinctions were more recognizable in and with an addition of the race factor. And that's what I'm arguing. And in fact, when you have a Jewish covenant and a people in covenant who all look the same, who practice the same faith in the same way, we can appreciate in Acts chapter 22 when Paul was arguing before that Jewish council and they listened to him carefully because he spake in the Hebrew tongue. But then when he said, Lo, I will send you to the Gentiles, the Bible says they listened patiently to him unto this word and said, Lo, he is not fit to live. Now, I don't think that's only religious distinctions because, in fact, they were going to accept certain individuals upon certain basis. It appears to me that it is a multifaceted issue. Now, William made the position that there was no uh, systematic racism to the 13th century, and history will bear that out. By the way, you and I know both together that the history books are not the ultimate source of authority. We would both agree with that, I think. I know we would, as a matter of fact, because we believe that the Bible ought to be studied for itself. If Solomon said in the long ago, there is no new thing under the sun, I'm not really looking for any new thing in the 1300s. Now, what distinction and difference does it all make? The fact is that today, I think that sometimes we struggle with the same things that they were struggling with. And God expected them to get over it. So he expects us to get over it as well. And so we come to the conclusion we're in perfect unity, that in fact we are together and in Christ. And God is looking on the heart. And so we should be able to look on the heart and not judge men according to the flesh as well. Now, I've got to get with my lesson. <laughs> Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter, no, I'm just beginning. <laughs> Revelation chapter 13. Of course, William already had stated it is one revelation. 
one revelation that we are studying. Now the timing of the revelation has already been stated by Jesus. In Luke 17, verse 30, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, and he which is on the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. Luke 17, 30 and 31. The word reveal there is the Greek word apocalypsis, the revealing of Christ. This revelation is the revealing. It's the same revealing of Christ. And so as Myron stated, once you've got the framework of a puzzle put together, you know that everything that you're trying to put together belongs within the framework of that puzzle. Well, we know that the revealing of Christ took place when Jerusalem fell, proven by Luke 17, 30, and 31. And therefore, as we approach the book, we put the pieces within that framework, including what we find in Revelation chapter 13, where we find two great beasts. One comes out of the sea, and another comes out of the land. So we'll notice in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns the ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. I'm not going to argue the same case again, but I believe that the seven heads, according to Revelation chapter 17, are Roman in their nature, and the ten horns are Jewish in their nature, and Rome was giving the authority for the persecution of the church, the kingdom of God, that was forming itself during this terrible persecution period. But the first thing we notice is that the beast comes from the sea. From a Jewish perspective, the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea, is without the land. The land is Palestine, Dan to Beersheba, about 180 miles. It comports with that 1,600 furlong citation in Revelation chapter 14, verse 20, beautifully. And so from Jewish perspective, should they talk about the sea, someone coming out of the sea, they're saying, some beyond the sea they're coming. The Gentiles are coming. And so this beast comes out of the sea. It is a Gentile uh, authority that's coming from the sea. Now, in apocalyptic literature, and especially in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah looked forward to a time in which the sea would be converted. Look in your Old Testaments now in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 5. The text says, Then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The abundance of the sea would be converted. He's not saying that H2O would repent and couldn't be baptized because it was already in the water. <laughs> He's talking about the Gentiles here, okay? The sea, you have the land, Palestine, that's their land. That's the promised land. That's how a Jew thought about his land and about his inheritance. But there would a time come, Isaiah 60, verse 3, where the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the sea will be converted. Now, through the New Testament, we find God breaking down the barriers. The law is dying, and God is building up a kingdom. And the Distinctions of Jew and Gentile, which involves culture, law, I believe race as well, all those things are being broken down so that when the new heavens and the new earth do appear, there's no more sea. Look now in Revelation chapter 21. In verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. New relationship with God above, new relationship with man beneath, 
For the first heaven and the first earth, which was Judaism, passed away, but not, notice now, and there was no more sea. No more distinction between Jew and Gentile. It's broken down in Christ, one body in Christ. That's what he's arguing. That's the consequence of seeing the heavens and the earth, which are spiritual in their nature. There's a wonderful text in Isaiah 51, 15, and 16. I think I saw it beautifully exegeted in Glenn's book a couple of years ago when I was reading through that text, in which the Lord roars and passes through the sea, and then He creates a new heaven and a new earth, and says unto Zion, Thou art my people. The heaven, the relationship with the authorities and the subjects, so to speak, with God above, man beneath, it's their world. That was the world that Peter was speaking about when he said the heavens and the earth which are now. That's the old covenant world, and the new covenant world was about to come. And so the results of the ending of the first heavens and earth brought forward the new heavens and earth, and there's no more sea. doesn't mean there's no more lake to swim in or a sea to go fish in, but it's spiritual in its nature. No more Gentile and Jew distinction. And so we find the sea beast, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Now I argued from Daniel chapter 7 that, in fact, there was given persecuting power to the one who had taken up the three ribs and taken up the three horns and taken up the three kings. That in the succession of the powers that that particular power being spoken about had acquired the previous powers to persecute. Now notice, this sea beast of Rome was likened unto the image which Daniel spoke about, about the four world empires. Now look at verse 2. And the beast which I saw was likened unto a leopard. Well, the leopard is back in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6. That's the Grecian empire which was ruled by Alexander the Great, the rough he-goat. And the bear was the Mede and Persian Empire, uh, which had the three ribs, you remember, in his mouth. And then in his mouth was the mouth of a lion. That was the Babylonian Empire with the wings. And the dragon gave him his power. And so the persecuting power of this beast now was given to the present persecuting power, attributed all the power of the kingdoms before them to persecute. That's what they were doing. They were bringing persecution, which God had granted to them for that spe uh, specific time. And, of course, his seat was great authority. In verse 3 he says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And this may well have reference to um, uh, to Nero's death, and then the resurgence of the persecution before the end of the Old Covenant. And the Bible says, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Now the dragon is identified earlier in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. That great dragon was cast out, old serpent called devil and, uh, and Satan. And yet the Bible says in verse 12, in the last statement of uh, Revelation 12, verse 12, he knows he hath but a short time. Now, I struggled with this text for years. And after I came to the conclusion that Jesus must have come in AD 70, I said, well, in some sense, the devil must be here. He's got to be. I remember talking to Don about three and a half years ago, and he told me, I think the devil is destroyed. I said, what? What did you tell me? that the devil is completely destroyed. <laughs> I wasn't very comfortable with that idea. I had preached many sermons on the devil. I had preached how the wiles of the devil can come and take us away uh, from the Lord. But I'm not, I don't remember if uh, Don gave me the illustration or William, or I found it some, from some other source, but it gave me a great deal of peace. 
There is racism in the world today, is there not? Was not Nazism in Germany a very harsh form of racism? Was not Hitler a, a grand racist? Cert certainly was, all right? Are there skinheads in the world today? Is there a new, new neo-Nazi movement today? Yes. Hitler's long gone, though, isn't he? But the results of Hitler's, Hitler's work are still here. Well, the devil was in the world for a long time, okay? And the results of what he's done, done is still here. However, if he's destroyed, I don't have to worry about him. I need to simply fear sin, not fear the devil taking me off somewhere I don't want to go. I think that's the concept, and that's the idea. And by the way, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, Paul said, and Satan would shortly be bruised, which in fact goes back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. That word bruised is the Greek word sontribo, used in Mark 14 verse 3 about the alabaster box that was going to be broken, completely crushed. The complete crushing of Satan was just around the corner. And what victory that would have given the early church. He doesn't have a power to accuse because the law is gone. He has no power to overcome because he is destroyed. And they were fighting the devil and all of his powers at that time. He had a miraculous power in that age. And it was about to come to an end. So we find that the dragon gave power to the beast, verse 4. And they asked the question, who is able to make war with him? Now, the Jews knew, the Jewish leadership knew that Rome had a great power. They were concerned about Rome coming, taking their place and their nation. You remember in John 11, verse 48, if we leave him thus alone, that is, as Jesus, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. It was purely political machination. It was a political move. These Jewish leaders were filled with themselves, filled with pride, filled with hatred, filled with an arrogance and their power, which they would not give up. And God was going to bring them down, but they were the ones, the instruments used by God, as well as the Romans. Now, in verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And again, we have the forty-two month theme. The mantra goes throughout the scripture, that times, times, and a half a time, the 1260 days, 1290 days of Daniel, uh, referencing the same time. And so that great persecution period that Daniel spoke about in his lesson, identified by Jesus in Matthew 24 and 21, had arrived. So then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. Here is the great persecution period. And he opened his mouth, verse 6 of Revelation 13, in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Of course, the powers of Rome did that very thing. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Of course, that was true of those Roman powers as well. And the delegated power even to the Jews. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that is the land, and give deference, give deference to him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The only ones that wouldn't pay him his dues, so to speak, were those who were in the book of life, because those who weren't in the book of life, they worshipped him. And he says, if any man uh, have an ear, let him hear. And then we have an interesting uh, comment by John in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 13. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Some reference to Nero may be here, the way that he was killed. But there may be something more at work here. Because this is the same language of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6, that they were going to repay tribulation to those that were giving them tribulation. And in Revelation chapter 18 verse 6, reward her the way that she rewarded you. So there may be a double entendre here, a double meaning of what John is trying to get across. 
But then we find another beast. Here's the sea beast, another beast coming out of the lamb, uh, out of the earth. So we find in verse 11, a beast out of the earth or the land, Geh, the sea, the Gentile power, now a purely Jewish power, a purely Jewish power. And he spake like a lamb, he had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. So he's going to appear as one of the servants of God, but he's going to fulfill the purposes of the devil. And the power of the land fits within the framework of the grand revelation and when Jesus identified his coming. So I'm not going to get in all the details because I want to get to the number of 666. I'm going to come back and do exegesis after the fact. Now, if it is the case that the sea references the Gentiles, which I think we've proven, makes perfect sense, and the land has reference to Palestine, and that's proven in Revelation 14 verse 20, and that makes perfect sense, then we ask ourselves, what power, what authority that was of a Jewish nature, of a Jewish nature, had the authority to make men worship, to force them, and also to persecute them? And in verse 18, we find that man finally identified as 600 and 66, 600, three score and six, 666. Now, when you study the gematria, which is the study of how numerical values are attributed to letters, Greek and Hebrew letters, the scholars who are more inclined to agree with us point to Neron Caesar, Kenneth Gentry in his book, Who is the Beast, argues this. This was an idea which was early. Neron Caesar 666. But let's say all of those guys are wrong. Let's just say it for a moment. They're all, we, we just don't really accept it because we think this is Jewish. All right? If that's the case, how would you go about determining what the Jews believed about 666? Seems to me we'd go to the Old Testament. Would we not? Is that reasonable? Is that reasonable to go to the Old Testament to look for the clue rather than to go to the scholars of the 10th and 11th and 12th and 13th centuries and watch their minds come together in the gematria of the age and only the elite could figure this out. I'm not really there to tell you the truth. I think that there's evidence throughout the scripture in order to understand this 666. By the way, I did some research into gem uh, gematria, the word itself. I'm interested in the etymology and derivation of terms, as many of you are. And I found out that gematria comes from the same basis as geometry. Geometry. And did you know that geometry was first the study of the measurements of the land? I didn't know that. Ah, interesting. Study of the land. The people of the land. What did they think about the symbols? What did they think about the symbols? Well, one... Saturday morning, I'm reading through the text, and I'm scratching my head, and it occurs to me to just get out my concordance, and I'm going to look up every 666 and 666 in the Old Testament. So I just get strongest concordance out. It's kind of wearing out now. And I just said, well, we'll see what I can find. And I tell Steve Baisden up in Ludington, that's what I'm doing. You get out your concordance and you start looking for 666. So, and six. 
And so we find out that six is a very regular number in the Old Testament. We find out that six is a prominent number in the Old Testament. Man was created on the sixth day. Remember? Genesis 2, 27 and 31. Man was commanded to work for six days. Acts, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. The Jews were commanded to sow their fields for six years. Leviticus 25 verse 3. The Jewish woman who bore a man child was unclean for 33 days, but a maid child for 66 days. I thought that was interesting. Leviticus chapter 12, 1 through 5. And then I come across this verse. Look at 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 14. All right. First Kings chapter 10 and verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600, three score and six talents of gold. Now he is now receiving money for the temple, for, re, for building the temple. 666 shekels of gold becomes this temple tax that he has to raise in order to build the temple, 666. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 38. Exodus 38. And we find the tabernacle being built. In verse 9, the Bible says, And he made the court on the south side southward. The hangings of the court were of the fine twine, uh, twined linen and hundred cubits, and their pillars were twenty. So on the south side of the tabernacle, there are twenty pillars. All right? Look at verse 11. And on the north side, the hangings were in hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty. That makes sense. So it's symmetrical. So 20 pillars in verse 10, 20 pillars in verse 11, 20 and 20 is 40, right? Verse 12, and of the west side were hangings of the 50 cubits and their pillars 10. Well, 20 and 20 and 10 are 50, right? Well, in verse 14, the Bible says the hangings of the one side of the gate were 15 cubits and the pillars were 3. 50 and 3 is 53, right? So in verse 15, for all the other side of the court of the gate, on the hand of that hand were hangings of the 15 cubits, their pillars are 3. So 53 and 3 are 56. And yet, in verse 19, at the other side of the pillars were 4. And 56 and 4 is 60. So 666 talents of gold becomes the temple tax, and the tabernacle has 60 pillars, six, okay, six. Now, in the chambers of the temple, there's going to be these compartments, and I want you to open your Bibles to Ezekiel uh, 38. Uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 40. I believe it's 40. Yes, got the wrong text here. So in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 5, there's going to be some measuring done in this temple. Verse 5, Behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about it, and a man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits. All right? Now I want you to go over to verse 12. And the space also before the little chamber was one cubit on this side, and the space was one cubit on that side, and the little chamber were six cubits on this side, and six cubits on this side. Little these chambers in the temple, six by six, sixty posts, six hundred and sixty-six shekels of gold, six by six. There's a text which says that the temple actually was approached by six steps. And we can go on into the imagery as I look through all of the Old Testament, but these are the ones that were more prominent or salient as I saw them. Now, if you're a Jew, and six has a temple imagery behind it, and the persecution is Jewish, 
And there is something, some who is, there is someone who is sitting in the temple of God that God is going to destroy. It looks like to me, he's speaking about the high priest, who is 666, six, six, who is the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, repay, tribulation to them. And the word trouble is the same Greek word. One of the problems with the King James Version is that when there is the same Greek word, sometimes they give us two different English words. And I don't think that's good business. There's a reason that the Holy Spirit gives a particular word. It's the Greek word phlipsis. Okay? Now, take tribulation. Uh, take the word tribulation and now take the word trouble out and put tribulation in. And notice what Paul says. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that give you tribulation. Ah, that's a different idea, isn't it? To me it was when I first understood it. All right? Now this tribulation is what was going to be granted those individuals that were giving the tribulation. And in Revelation 18, verse 6, you reward her with the way that she rewarded you. Who was persecuting the Thessalonians? Well, look at Acts chapter 17, and we'll discover just who was persecuting the Thessalonians. Paul, though he is a prophet and an apostle to the Gentiles, does as his habit dictated, goes into the Sabbath day, into the synagogue, and reasons with them out of the scriptures. But he goes there's a, into Thessalonica, and in chapter 17, verse 1, in the last statement of Revelation 17, verse 1, last sentence there, he says, he came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now the Jews do not appreciate what Paul is preaching. And so in verse 5, the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. What was the problem? The Jews were persecuting them. Paul writes to the Thess Thessalonians, and he says, it is a righteous thing with God, to repay tribulation to them who are giving you tribulation. Who was giving them tribulation but the Jews? The Jews were. And so now Paul speaks to the Thessalonians about the coming of the Lord. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor as by letter from us. Brother Daniel called me a couple of months ago and said, as by letter from us, those are the false apostles. Good job, Daniel. Good thinking. We get the good men, good young men thinking about these things. We're going to clear up all these little difficulties in Scripture. All right? And that the day of the Lord is at, is at hand. Bad translation. Bad translation. If you have vines, dictionary of New Testament words, there's a wonderful comment. It says it just missed it here. It should be that the day has come. It's the same issue of 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, that Hymenaeus and Philetus, Jewish false teachers, who said that the resurrection is past already, or if the resurrection is past already and the temple is standing, and they still have their, their law and their conscience argument and the fact that they can continue the way that they're practicing and then tend to Judaize. No, 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 no. The day has not yet come. By the way, this is one of the earliest letters of the New Testament, 50 A.D. It must have been reasonable to believe that the day of the Lord was coming within their generation. As a matter of fact, everybody believed it because Jesus said that it would come in that generation. So now he says in verse 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. Well, that's Matthew 24, verse 12. 
the love of the many. Don pointed out here a couple of months to me, there's an article there. That's a wonderful revelation. The love of the many shall wax cold. The great falling away. He's not talking about the falling away in the 1200s and the 1300s, which will lead the way to the Reformation so that the Pope will be destroyed. I mean, it's nonsense what our brethren have come up with. But notice, the falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I believe the man of sin is 666. And that's a Jewish persecuting power. Now, this man who is revealed, who is the man of sin, Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the high priest. That's the high priest. I don't have any doubt about it. Let's read a few verses. Go to Acts chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And by the way, I have outlines of all my lessons in the back for $20 a piece. No, i kidding. They're all free. <laughs> uh, I'm only kidding you. Um, verse 6 and 7. And Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, by what name have you done this? Who gathered them? Why it was the high priest with the high priest who was ruling. He is the one who wants to question the apostles. Look at Acts chapter 5 verse 17. Then the high priest rose up and they that were with him with a sect of the Pharisees and they were filled with indignation. The high priest is leading the way. He's got this righteous indignation. He's going to put down and stamp down the church any way that he can. He is ruling. Look at Acts chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Then said the high priest, are these things so? Who was the presiding authority listening to Stephen's case? Who was sitting in the temple of God as God making decisions which he should not have been, made, been making? It was the high priest. Look at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if they found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Look at Acts chapter 22. In verse 5, Paul would say, Also the high priest doth bear me witness in all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. It is a righteous thing to recompense tribulation to them that give you tribulation. God was going to repay. He's going to repay by destroying that man who sat in the temple of God claiming to be God. Look at Acts chapter 23. Verse 1 beginning. Paul earnestly beholding the council and said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Who commanded Paul to be smitten? The high priest, how come they did it? He's sitting in the place of God. So he claims. Verse 3. 
Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whitest wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? It's like talking against the president which in our society we want to do, but we ought to be careful what we say about our leaders. We can criticize a policy without criticizing the individual and criticizing him in some nasty way. We should watch what we say. We really should. Whoever is in the White House, and I didn't want to talk about that. That's just so ridiculous what's about to transpire. Either way, it's going to be terrible. All right. So now... Now, by the way, write me in. I'm running for president right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll, I, William, I'll vote for you, brother. All right. Uh, now, what Paul says in verse 5, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Who was the ruler of the people? The high priest sitting in the temple of God, showing that he is God. Now, go back to 2 Thessalonians. And this man who was sitting in the temple of God, claiming to be God, ordering the persecution against the Thessalonians, is a wicked man. Verse 8, when that wicked shall be revealed. He's going to be revealed by the coming of the Lord, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, who destroy him with the brightness of his coming. To whom did Jesus speak in Matthew 26 and verse 64? Open your Bibles again, Matthew 26 and verse 64. Jesus is now speaking before the Sanhedrin. And he's speaking about to the Jewish leaders. So notice beginning in verse 62 of Matthew 26. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. He was invoking upon him the oath of the testimony in which something had to be said. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Mark 14, uh, 63 says, uh, I am. And so it means the same thing. Nevertheless, I say unto you hereafter, shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And the Son of Man was going to reveal the man of sin. And the old covenant world would be punished. And in fact, Jesus was coming to alleviate their terrible persecution. Just have a few minutes. Now, I believe that's the answer to the 666. And if that's the case, then the framework of Revelation chapter 13 should fit as well. And sometimes you learn to look at a passage differently because you see the framework is different. So I remember struggling with the concept, I told uh, to this at, at breakfast this morning with Don, I struggle with the concept of the body. What I didn't see, that many times Paul is speaking about a corporate body, a spiritual body. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's not the physical body is not dead because of sin. Romans 8 and verse 10. It's that body that had died because of sin. Israel sinned and he died, but now the spirit was giving it life. That was the concept of Romans chapter 8. It was a, a, corporate, a corporate body. So you begin to rethink and rework these passages. Now go back to Revelation chapter 13 about this source that comes out of the land. All right. Verse 12, He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them to dwell therein, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now remember that the Jewish leaders want 
They didn't bring the revolt. The zealots did. The Jewish leaders wanted the Romans to keep their power and everything to remain stable because they were rich and powerful. Now you think about someone who has a position like a Supreme Court judge who's paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, who has great authority, and he knows that some other authority, if it's removed, they're going to lose their place. You can see how the Jews would go politically in bed with Rome in order to keep their place and their power. And I think that's exactly what the idea is, and that fits perfectly with verse 11, who's like the lamb and, speak, and speaks as a dragon. So verse 13, he doeth great wonders, so that he make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And you remember the high priest prophesied that, it's not, that it was expedient for one man to die, lest a nation perish in John chapter 11. It appears that there is some evidence in Josephus' writings that the high priest actually, they were making certain predictions. And that may well have been some of the wonders that this man was producing so that men would have false hope in him. And so, verse 14, He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth, the land, by those means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Now, we are to be conformed to the image of God's Son, not to the image of the land or of the world, which were working in tandem to persecute the church. Verse 15, He had power uh, to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And in fact, the Jewish authorities wanted the Romans uh, to keep uh, their power lest they would lose their power. And I think that's all involved in uh, what's transpiring here. Then in verse 16, He causeth all both, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead. Now you remember in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3, God's servants were marked in the forehead. Perhaps a suggestion of sincerity, whereas those who followed the beast, some were sincere, but many were not. They simply followed in the hand. That may be the significance of verse 16. In verse 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, the name of the beast, or number of his name. Because they controlled the land, every individual that did not give not due deference to the Roman, uh, the Jewish authorities, which also wanted the Roman authorities to keep their Roman authorities. It made it very difficult. And it wasn't the case in Acts chapter 8 that there was a great uh, persecution and it was so difficult for a Jewish Christian that he could not even stay in Jerusalem. There was a dispersion. There was uh, a leaving except the apostles stayed before. And so I can in fact see how that no one can live an ordinary life while this man has his control and his power over the land. So here is wisdom. Verse 18. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Now, Daniel did a great job in his lesson. The wise would understand, would they not? Those were God's people would understand. They would understand their book, their covenant. They would understand the concept of temple imagery and 666. For it is the number of a man, his number is six hundred and three score and six. And I'm convinced it was the high priest. I debated a fellow a couple of weeks ago in South Haven, Michigan, who believes, member of the Church of Christ, conservative member of the Church of Christ, but not all members of the Church of Christ are quite as churlish as he is. But nevertheless, he is difficult to deal with. And he believed that the man of sin is the Pope. Interesting enough, in Churches of Christ, we view ourselves as the answer to denominationalism. For we demand Bible authority for all that we do. So we baptize for the remission of sins, have the Lord's Supper, don't use instrumental music, and we'll debate anybody at any time on these matters. I still believe those fundamentals. I just think once you're in Christ, there's plenty of grace to get it. Okay? That's my only difference right now. There's plenty of grace to come around uh, and, and study these things out and, 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 le and learn the truth. But during the debate, I preached a funeral for a Seventh-day Adventist family. And a little boy had died uh, uh, tragically. Uh, it, it, he, he, it, it was, 
in the womb. He died uh, uh, in the womb. It was uh, a miscarriage, but he was already uh, 20, I think 24 weeks old. It was very sad for the family. So the young man attends with us and his wife is Adventist and the family is Adventist. And I went to the funeral and um, preached the funeral that Friday of the debate and um, I was talking to the family and I said, you know, I, I, I'd like to stay, but I really have to go. I have to prepare. I have a debate later on. And so there were four or five of them standing. He said, what it's about? I said, well, it's about the coming of the Lord and the resurrection. And they said, uh, and we've been discussing the man of sin. And all the Adventists said, that's the Pope. That's what they said. All the Adventists said, that's the Pope. Well, my opponent says, that's the Pope. And you find that concept in denominationalism, in everywhere. You know why? They got it from Martin Luther. Yeah, yeah. A scholar who was fought by the Catholics, gotta be, gotta be the man of sin here, that Jesus is going to come one day and take this persecution away. And I'm not going to minimize the persecution that Martin Luther was in, but Martin Luther is not my authority. John Calvin's not my authority. Show me an argument from the truth. Show, give me the scriptures, just the scriptures. Let me reason. I know when I'm being honest. I'm trying to be as honest as I possibly can. So when I stand up and I argue with, with William, I'm trying to be honest what I see in scripture. I have no personal ill will toward you. I love all of you. I love my brothers, my sisters. I, love every, I hope I love everyone so that I want everyone saved. But I will not accept a position that I can't see, and neither should you. Yeah. Unless you believe it, unless it makes sense to you, don't let anyone bully you into any position. Amen. And even Holger Neubauer, don't let him do it, because he, he can get forceful. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. I told Daniel this. When you can go into a place and preach with a clear conscience, and allow everything you believe to be said. That is worth to me more than a hundred million dollars. I, I can't express to you what a blessing it is for me to be with you. How much I love you all and what a blessing you've been in my life. God bless you all. Thank you, brother. Good job.